Oh no, why should he devote time to what's happening? Well, the, I mean, I think the two best reasons are compassion uh, for our fellow humans, and it's cheaper to keep people alive than it is to let them expire. That's a damn good reason. The whole, you know, if somebody dies, that's quite a large cost financially as well as emotionally, it's to do with family members, etc., etc. Just the bottom line is it's cheaper not to let people die horribly. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, you have the direct cost of premature death, and every premature death exerts a ripple effect through a family, through a neighborhood, through a town. And you have these direct costs associated with premature death, but you have the indirect costs. And since 2000, I have overdosed on two occasions. And both times, there was someone there to save me um, with naloxone. And, and in both of those cases, actually, the overdose resulted in, or resulted from, mismanaged prescriptions on the part of the people who were caring for my spinal injury. Uh, you know, two, three doctors not knowing what each other was prescribing um, and getting me on board with multiple opioid analgesics combined with muscle relaxers. And so in, in both of those cases, my life was saved. So naloxone for me is a very personal, very personal thing. And then as an outreach worker, since 2000, we've been distributing naloxone in Chicago. And in the context of doing outreach, in the course of doing outreach, I've had occasion to use it 25 times on 22 different people. And these are people who, in some cases, are people I didn't know at all or very well, but in most of those cases, they were people that I knew quite well. And they were long-term participants of, of our program. So, your life was saved by naloxone twice. Twice. And you've then saved, you've saved 23 people. 23 people. 25 of us. 23 people. Yeah, a couple of them were a couple of times. Um, some of those people, I assume, have gone on to use naloxone as well themselves. Yeah, in fact, in 2008, when I was staying in that warehouse on the west side and my friend Steve overdosed, and fortunately there was naloxone and we were able to resuscitate him, revive him, he actually, at that point, had already reversed 32 or 33 overdoses himself, other people's overdoses. Yeah. Since then, since 2008, he's reversed another 48. Okay, so you've, you've got the 23 you've done, and if we just say Steve and we say the 48 that since you administered to him, mm -hmm. so there's like over 70 people who if you mm -hmm. hadn't been safe with an oxo, would yes. be dead, or would possibly be dead. Possibly, yeah. So, as you say, the ripple effect and the cost effectiveness thing kind of really does kick in there. And, you know, never mind all of the other reasons for like having this, you know, encouraging people into services, it showing that you give a damn whether or not somebody's going to live or die. You know, that thing of saying, you know, we care if you're alive or not, here, have this thing to stay alive. Right. But what, what well, I think that's, a, I mean, that's a really good point because people like Steve are not unusual in our experience all across the U.S., right? We have a couple of hundred programs distributing naloxone, and in every situation, people who, who receive the training, who go through what is usually a very brief educational session, get the naloxone, they become care providers in their own networks. So it's not like, I mean, Steve might be a bit above the norm um, with 70 or so reversals, 70 some odd reversals now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not that far out of the norm. What sort of models are there running that you're aware of? Well, in the US, I think we have three primary models. And the, the most common is what we call a standing order, which is how we 
historically did it with the Chicago Recovery Alliance. And in that situation, you have a physician who has signed on to give back into a, a take-home naloxone distribution program. And that physician then creates what we call a standing order, trains outreach workers, empowers those outreach workers to then pass on the education and the actual naloxone with the intramuscular syringes to administer it. And it's all authorized by the physician. And that's really the dominant way of doing it. It's not, it's not legal in every situation. And in fact, for us, for a lot, a lot of those years, uh, those early years of doing naloxone, it wasn't legal. It was at best a gray area of the law. Another model is completely underground, completely outlawed. We have about 25 or so harm reduction syringe access programs around the country who are just doing it. They're being provided naloxone by programs that are getting it more above board and they are redistributing to the people in their communities. In both of these situations with standing orders operating mostly over most of this period since 2000 in the gray area of the law and with completely underground outlaw cutting edge renegade programs the philosophy is the same just do it we haven't we have no regard we have no respect for any law that unnecessarily endangers compromise threatens human life and so that's just what we've done. For me, it's immoral not to act. When we figured out how we could get naloxone, every minute we spent not getting it and not distributing it was immoral. So where you've got programs that are spending six, eight, nine months coming up with paperwork that they can do so that they can give it out and make sure that everything's accounted for and everything's done, that's six or eight or nine months you could be talking an overdose a week, you could be talking mm -hmm. in, in some areas even more than that, an overdose a day. And that is tens, maybe hundreds of people who would have possibly been alive. Mm -hmm. But because somebody wanted to get the paperwork just right on making sure that every box was ticked, those people are dead. You're absolutely right. I mean, in this, in this context, with this issue, paperwork kills in a much more direct way than shame kills. And I, and I think at the root of it is people who are concerned more about their own jobs, their own li livelihoods than about the lives of others, right? Because this is what they want. They want to insulate themselves with paperwork rather than getting out there and doing what's necessary to to help people continue to live. Or even more so, they want to make sure that they've got a good little piece of research that they can base mm -hmm. the next year's worth of conference touring and everything based around and right. show, you know, oh, we've been doing this thing. We'll ignore how many people died while we were setting it up, mm -hmm. but we've been doing this thing. Oh yeah, countless careers have been made out of the deaths of others. But you know, I think that another issue that's raised is, you know, many programs contact us when they're getting started and they're instituting trainings that last four to eight hours. You know how long it takes me to train somebody to do naloxone? Two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Two and a half minutes. And they have these elaborate protocols, which are really designed more to cover the asses of the agencies that have gotten involved in the distribution of naloxone than, it, than to do anything else. Because you don't need four hours. You barely need four minutes to teach somebody how to use this drug, uh, this medication. Uh, it's so incredibly easy to use. So what, what do you think of the, the sort of the barriers? I mean, we've got people saying that the, the main barrier is the lack of rigorous research around the LOXO, which to me is the sort of the weirdest chicken and egg argument I've ever heard. It's like, we have no rigorous research on this, so let's not do it at all, rather than let's get some research. But what, do you think that is a barrier, or do you think that... I think the... The, the argument that we need more research is a reflection of cowardice on the part of people who have taken an oath to enable life in every possible way, physicians. So in a randomized 
controlled trial, we necessarily, by design, would be randomizing opioid users or family members of opioid users or however we construct the study into two arms. One arm consisting of people who are at risk of overdose who get naloxone and the other arm people at risk of overdose who do not get naloxone. Yeah. So we knowingly deny a large number of people potentially. We knowingly a, allow the death of a person yeah. that we know that with a relatively cheap medication we could save them. Exactly. So I think that physicians often hide behind the lack of rigorous empirical research argument out of cowardice and that's really a result of I think that's a result of many factors but you know it's risk aversion in the most despicable way mm. in my view and I think the whole the research thing is nothing but a, a poor excuse um, it's a barrier that gets put in there because people don't want to necessarily say the real reasons that they don't want somebody to have naloxone. It's the same as the arguments of this person might use more drugs if we give them the safety net. Mm -hmm. If we give them the safety net of naloxone, then surely that means that they'll feel free to use more heroin. Well, do you know what they might do? They might feel free to use more heroin. It's exactly the same as I feel free to drive slightly more recklessly because I have a seatbelt. Um, a diabetic feels free to have the occasional treat of some chocolate because they know they've got insulin to back it up with. But you're not going to take the insulin off them right. because they occasionally have chocolate. But for some reason it seems that that's fine to do if somebody's a drug user. Mm -hmm. As I think you said at the conference recently, you know, the, the moment that somebody starts expressing the behaviours of the illness for want of a better word that we know that they have of you know drug use and addiction etc the moment they start expressing that we then punish them for what we're supposed to be helping them with. exactly um, that's just wrong <laughs> there's just no other word than wrong on that no it's a, it's a really good point and it strikes me as quite biblical <laughs> the wages of sin is death <laughs> And for what other disease condition do we institutionalize this passage, this wages of sin is death? This is what we're going to do. We're going to set up your treatment in such a way that you're going to die. That's not a very effective treatment. No. The level at which, the level to which we need to aspire is not only universal access, but universal demand. Everyone needs to demand this. And I think it's the demand thing that's the important thing for me. It's the reason that we should be doing peer education is so that those peers can demand access to a drug that will, or a medication, let's stop calling it a drug, because in this kind of context, a drug comes with all this extra baggage. It's a medication for saving lives. Mm -hmm. It's a medical intervention for saving lives. And it's not that we're talking thousands of dollars worth of cancer treatment that somebody doesn't get because they live in the wrong area of town. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively inexpensive drug that's then made more expensive by all this other stuff and all this other sort of admin that gets put on top of it. And we've got to train every single drugs worker to do every single aspect of naloxone stuff and then we've got to make sure that it's all documented and research based and if you get a chunk of money that chunk of money should be used to making naloxone and putting naloxone into a person's hands mm -hmm. and if it's not being used to put money into the person's hands it should be used in raising awareness with those people that they need it and why they need it and why they should take it whether they think they're going to overdose or not. I've, I've had people who say, oh, it's all right, I've never overdosed. Great. You've never overdosed. I've never crashed my car. Mm -hmm. oh, but I still make sure I drive on the right side of the street and I still keep the insurance up on my car just in case. Right. You know, it's insurance. It's something that we have there. 
it is the ultimate insurance policy. Mm -hmm. This other manifestation of stigma, which has to do with the research argument, <clears throat> and that is the concern, the expressed concern on the part of many physicians that this, this uh, distribution of naloxone is somehow going to enable aggravated use, right? This is going to amplify use. This is going to encourage additional risk taking, which I think fundamentally reflects a lack of understanding of how drug use culture operates, how people actually go about using substances. But the bigger problem with that is that, in, is that naloxone enables life. And so as a physician, what would you rather have? Even Let's just say that it does have these effects in some instances. Would you rather have somebody still breathing and therefore uh, enjoying the opportunity to continue doing whatever it is they do or discontinue doing whatever it is they do? Or would you rather have them dead? I mean, it's literally a matter of life and death. And all of this other stuff is just really perverse window dressing. Well, every one of us is a potential overdose victim. Every one of us is a potential first responder. Yeah. We're all bystanders to overdose. The only question is, what are we going to do about it?